Hello and welcome to the Mindful Men podcast, the show helping men to open up about manhood. My name is Simon Rennie and my aim is to get men talking. From mental health to fatherhood and everything in between, Mindful Men creates a safe space for conversation. Now, before we get into this episode, I want to say a huge thank you for joining me. It means a world for you to join me and talk about men's issues. And if you love what you hear, please subscribe and share the episode with your mates. You can also join the conversation on Instagram and YouTube, and I'd love to connect with you there. But for now, sit back, relax, and let's get mindful. G'day guys, and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men Podcast. I'm your host, Simon Rennie, and today we're getting mindful about mindset, mental health, leadership, and sport. And joining me for this discussion is Brian Moylet coming at us from Vancouver, Canada. How are you going, Brian? Yeah, I'm doing really well. Thanks, Simon. Looking forward to having a chat and cheers for having me on. Thanks for coming on. I'm really excited for this discussion. In Australia, we're a sports mad country, so it's going to be great to talk about elite sport with you today and, and your sporting history as well. But a quick trigger warning that we are talking about mental health today. So if mental health discussions do trigger you, please feel free to skip this episode. But if you do stick around and you do get triggered, please reach out to your support networks afterwards. Now, Brian, you've got a bit of a CV. You're an author, speaker, podcast host of Off-Field Rugby. You're a former Irish age grade international rugby player. You're a mindset and performance coach. And you help players and teams across the globe to achieve high levels of performance as well. So quite a CV. It sounds really exciting. And we'll dive into all this today. But I'd like to start off finding a bit more about you and where you grew up and key moments that kind of led you towards rugby. Yeah, cheers, Simon. When you name out those different things, just think of it as a journey. Just keep taking it as it comes. And yeah, so I grew up in the west of Ireland, uh, kind of a small enough town, we'll say about 8,000 people. And I was sport mad. I remember from a very young age, just wanting to do everything that I could. And I grew up about two miles from the local rugby club. So I remember when I was six years of age I remember chatting to mum and dad and a few of the lads in my class had started playing rugby and I said to them hey can I go down on Saturday to play rugby they were telling me all about it it was the talk of the class and they said oh, I think you're a bit small Brian but you can maybe next year then I turned around and I said but mum I'm bigger than three of the guys so they're already <laughs> allowed to play so she didn't have a comeback and so I started playing rugby at the age of six and as I said, I was just sport mad. Like I played a lot of Gaelic football, basketball, hurling, a couple of Irish sports, soccer, football, whatever, just anything I could, boxing. But I remember one day when I was, say, eight or nine, we were sitting in the front room, the TV room, and dad switched the channel. On came an Ireland rugby match and they were playing France. And I remember saying to dad, like, what's this? He said, oh, it's the Six Nations. I go, what's that? He's like, it's a tournament Ireland playing every year. I was like, okay, cool. And is that the only Irish team? Are there other Irish teams? And he said, yeah, there's the under 20s and the under 18s. And I loved rugby. And I remember at that moment just being like, right, that's what I want to do. I want to play with the Ireland under 18s. Because that's the youngest one there is. And I was eight or nine and that's the, the the first one. So I remember getting up and going out to the garage, getting my boots, getting the ball and just going out into the back garden, running around, kicking ball as if I was playing on the TV for Ireland. And I remember just that was just a dream from then on. And it was funny when I work with young players now with the mental side of the game, what I often find is that you start to limit yourself as you get older, we'll say early 20s, late teens, you start to kind of put caps on yourself and you become very realistic. Whereas I was an eight-year-old kid and I was like, I'm going to play for the Ireland under 18. So it was 10 years away. It's a bit mad when you think about how big that dream is. But anyway, that's what I love as kids. You just dream big and you don't, you don't think twice. You don't talk yourself out of it. And anyway, just started playing lots and lots of sports growing up. And rugby kind of was always the main one. I was a keen basketballer as well but I remember watching the NBA and being like even in my younger years kind of realizing like yeah Brian I <laughs> don't know if you're going to crack that one now I was tall enough for the west of Ireland in my little community and I did all right but I didn't think I'd go too far so anyway yeah rugby was was the main one and I just I worked really hard but it, growing up we were only told about we'll say the physical side of the game so go to the gym get out on the field work hard on the training field and the more you do that, 
the more successful you will be. That's what we were told. And that was the best knowledge that they had, the people who were telling us that. But I never knew anything about the mental side of it. Some days I'd be really confident, the team be going well. Other days my confidence would dip and that's just completely normal. Everyone goes through it. But I don't really know how to deal with that. So the only tool I had was, as they said, work hard in the gym or on the field. So I would just try and outwork the lack of belief or confidence throughout my teens, whenever it would come. Don't get me wrong, a lot of the time I was in a good space. But I remember then when I was 17 and I was brought into the Irish under 18s camp and I was just like, whoa, this is where I want to be. And like, I literally... That was my my only dream growing up. Like I didn't want to be a doctor or an astronaut or a fireman or any of these other things that people say. I just wanted to play for that Ireland under 18 team. And anyways, first camp went really well, was really excited, was buzzing for it. Second camp went really well, was kept on, was brought in again for the third camp. And this was right before the first game against Italy. And we were told that we were like, this is the last cut the last one and then 22 guys are going to get selected play against Italy in two weeks I remember then feeling like a bit of nerves and being like whoa wow here we are it's like all the rest was great fun and whatever but wow this is a bit I said the nerves started to become I'm not going to say overwhelming but they really started to build up and then we were in a team meeting room the forwards before the first training session on that first day of the third camp and the coach went into the corner of the room. There was one of these paper flip charts. And he said, right, I'm going to go through lineouts. You'll have about 10 minutes to learn them. And this is what separates club and provincial from national team. So you need to be screwed on. You need to learn all these. And then we're going out repping them. And I started to feel like, oh, geez. And I started to panic a little bit. I started to feel kind of weight on my chest, kind of weight on my shoulders. I started to look around at other guys, seeing where they feeling what I was feeling. And then the coach started scribbling all these lineups, kept going, kept going, kept going. And I'm just like, oh my God, getting in my head, thinking like, oh, I'm getting found out here. Like, oh no, this is, this is as far as I go. Like, no, no, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I just lost all confidence in myself. We went out onto the field, I froze. I had no energy. I couldn't do it. I kept telling myself I shouldn't be here. I kept telling myself I'd been found out and essentially capitulated. I'd done all the work. Don't get me wrong. I was strong, fit, everything. I'd done all the physical work. But the mental side, self-doubt, never an issue, never held me back. And then this time, literally on the cusp of achieving the dream that I had dreamt about for 10 years, like a decade, I capitulated. And that's mm. the first time I learned about the importance of the mental side of the game and obviously I'm, I'm 30 now so it's quite a while ago but that kind of set me on a journey I always want to be better like always have and always am I suppose I've been interested in personal development before I knew what the word was as an athlete you're just like always wanting to be better and so I then realized if I'm to go on in rugby or to do anything I have to become stronger mentally and it was my first instant when I started to understand that the mental side of sport was important and that is something that I need to work on and it happened to me later in my career then when I got an injury and resulted in me becoming very depressed and so I really started then to see how this is so important because something on the field in sport can then have knock-on effects to really affect your mental health and unfortunately you see it where ex-pro athletes kill themselves and mm. different things and I'm sure there's a lot of lot of things at play, but it's a very common thing of people saying that when they retire or when they get injured or all these different things that happen that it can really affect your mental health. So for the past two years, yeah, I've been on a mission to help young players with the mental side of the game. And that's why I started offfieldrugby.com, started my Instagram, started the podcast, and then now most recently the book, which I put out two weeks ago. So so it's a bit long-winded there, but uh, yeah, just touching on a few bits. Yeah, Thinking back to that very young version of yourself, that one that got this idea of playing rugby and was running around the backyard with a ball. What was it about rugby? Because Ireland's got a lot of different sports that are available and global sports as well that you could have chosen. You said basketball, soccer, Gaelic footy as well. Yeah, what was it about rugby that really drew you in? Rugby was big in our area and my dad played rugby at a high level. So it was always there, but 
to be honest, Gaelic football, basketball and rugby were my three main ones. Up until I would say maybe 15, I would maybe have thought of playing Gaelic football for my county. The basketball thing, I don't know, it was just, it was big in our community. And as I said, my dad played it and I just thought that was cool. It was a bit of an international state, like an international jersey, whereas Gaelic football is your county. You play for your county team, which, don't get me wrong, is incredible. Like, it's it's so cool. And But I remember just out of the three, basketball, I realized it wouldn't happen. And then Gaelic football and rugby, I was between the two. And wearing a green jersey, like playing for your country, was just, just kind of caught me. I was just like, that would be unreal, like to wear yeah. the Irish jersey. So that was kind of why at that moment... I had that dream and I just started to love rugby more and more then the way the game is with, I feel it's a mix of everything. Like I feel it's a mix of basketball, Gaelic football, soccer, and then with a bit of wrestling or the physicality side of it. So I loved just how multifaceted it was and every sport I played, I felt helped my rugby. Yeah. I just love the game. Yeah, wow. And you mentioned that your mum said that you were too small to start off. And we're having this very discussion with my five-year-old at the moment. So we live in Queensland, Australia, and Queensland is a big rugby state in, in terms of rugby league and rugby union as well. And and so I'm a little bit hesitant as a dad with my five-year-old going, oh, like, do I want you growing up playing rugby? Or if he says soccer, I mean, he can do whatever he wants, really. But the thought of playing something like rugby, because it is quite a brutal sport. I grew up playing Australian rules football, so that's brutal in itself. But I guess rugby is one where two opposing teams are going head on at each other. Yeah, like what was it like going out, running on the field for the first time as a young fella? And like, did you have any nerves or were there bigger kids on the field? And did that make you feel scared? Or like, what was that feeling like for you? Yeah, it's funny, even though I said I'm six foot five now or something, but I was a small kid and I was young for my age. The way the age group worked out, I was like three days over age for the year below. So I was playing with kids 11 months, 10 months older than me. The physicality thing wasn't so big. Like when you're six, seven, eight, ten years of age, there's just a lot of grabbing. Like There's no one really that physical. But yeah, I do remember feeling fear for sure around the tackling around the physical side of it but in a good way that kind of fear that it's like it's exciting I suppose it's adrenaline it's the rush Mm. and there's so many other things to be honest the fear of losing is massive as well the fear of not getting into the team is another thing that would have been on my mind back then as well as like the fear of getting hurt like the fear of getting hurt wasn't really so big but there's lots of different fears but that's what excites you And that's why you want to be there. Yeah, definitely. And I experienced similar growing up playing Aussie Rules footy and kind of crossed that line. And all of a sudden, the the big guys don't seem as big as they did the warm ups and all that type of stuff. And once you get into the zone and I guess the mindset of being on the field, then that all kind of drops away and kind of just get your game on. But also you mentioned before, around eight years old, you developed this desire to play international rugby. And for a lot of guys that I knew growing up, once, once we hit that, 15, 16 year old mark where we could go one of two directions. One, we can keep pursuing that dream of playing a professional footy. But then for a lot of us and myself included, things like alcohol and partying comes into play. So for myself, partying became the thing that I would rather do on the weekends than go and play footy and train. And and as a result, my mindset shifted away from that dream I always had of playing professional footy. How did you work through that and navigate those teen years to then make that cut and make that team? Well, I was lucky in a way in that when I was 15, I went to a boarding school. I wasn't studying. I was hanging out around the town when I was a kid and mom kind of was like, he needs to concentrate. I have a younger brother now who's a doctor and he's very academic. I wasn't and he wasn't sent away, but I was. So we didn't drink. So that, Mm. I suppose, kept me on the straight and narrow in that sense. And it was a rugby school and I was just mad for it and there was just so much rugby to be played so it was kind of like a hothouse in that sense but then when I left school I was still playing high level rugby like I captained my provincial 20s team I made the Irish under 19s the next year and I was playing high level for the next few years I do remember that the the drinking I was always a rugby player first and I still had those dreams but I did fall into the drinking and in Ireland it's a very heavy drinking culture and so 
I would be training, burning the candle at both ends, so to speak. And when I look back, there was definitely trauma there. And I was drinking to, I suppose, get away from certain feelings. When I was 10, my little sister died. Uh, Mm -hmm. So it was challenging. And then my mom suffered quite a lot with anxiety after my dad suffered from depression. And they're both doing great now, thankfully. But for a few years there as a teenager, it was was very challenging at home. Like we were all grieving. My sister died. She had leukemia, so she was sick for three or four years. And yeah, and then my parents were struggled for a while, as you can only imagine. And so for a lot of my teenage years, it was very very challenging at home and that was something that sport sport was always an outlet because when mm-hmm. you say about crossing the, the line and people don't seem as big but when you cross the line you can get into the zone and when you're in the zone you don't think of anything else so sport was always a place where I got away from all that where it was like everything was all good like life was a one brilliant when I was on the field so I just wanted to be on the field as much as I could I wanted to be playing as much as I could because it was a happy place we'll say and so then when I was 18, I was still driven. I was still like going to the gym four times a week, five times a week training. But I go drinking twice a week, maybe three times a week. And then when I was 21, I calmed it down a bit. I started working and it would be once a week just after my game on a Saturday. But yeah, I wasn't a model pro or very disciplined in that sense. And I wanted it so badly, but I didn't really accept how important your lifestyle was and I Mm. suppose at that age it doesn't catch up with you as much when you're 18 19 it doesn't catch up with you and then even I was 21 two three and I had calmed it down quite a bit I was being a bit responsible and it was kind of once a week after the game on a Saturday we'd start drinking when a final whistle blew at four o'clock and we'd stop when we couldn't get another drink at 4 a.m probably and Mm. looking back I'm like I kind of nearly feel sorry for that guy because Mm. As I then grew up in my mid-twenties, I chilled with the drinking when I started to, I suppose, go on a bit of a journey inward. And yeah, I started to find other tools in which to, I suppose, first of all, understand what I was going through maybe, and then find other tools by which to deal with emotions that I was starting to understand or feelings. And so I, I, I kind of started now, I pretty much don't drink maybe. Once or twice a year, I'll have a couple of drinks. But yeah, so when I was younger, the drinking definitely I did. But I I was able to do both until if I wasn't drinking when I was 18, 19, 20, 22, who knows? But look, it is what it is. Yeah, I guess you've described something that so many young guys particularly go through in, in growing up playing sport. And they've got these big dreams of doing big things, but then often like culture and society and life gets in the way as well. And they kind of go down a bit of a rabbit warren that they didn't intend to. And a lot of guys particularly don't have a lot of support. It's like where I grew up in the northern suburbs of Adelaide, and this was in the 80s and 90s. So there wasn't that mindset around what you do outside of training and outside of the game as well. It was kind of like you just left to your own devices and off you go. But talk us through like that moment where you started to think, okay, what I'm doing now isn't great. And I want to start looking inwards and doing some inner reflection like what was that like for you to transition from just doing what you were doing to looking inwards and starting the healing process yeah so when I was 23 I went to the states on a rugby scholarship like I was still talking around when I was 18 19 I was kind of drinking heavily but then when I was in my early 20s it was once a week because I was very committed to my rugby and I was semi-pro so I was working as well during the week gym in the morning training on the field in the evenings playing like the div one the one below the top pros and top level of club rugby so but then when i was 23 i got a scholarship to go to the states and do a master's and it came right out of the blue a friend of mine was there and a position came up and he told me to go for it and i was like oh i can't because i'm playing rugby back home and i want to kind of go places in the uk and ireland or france maybe but then He called me again and I was like, yeah, that just seems like too good an opportunity to turn down. So I went off to St. Louis when I was 23 and I was made ineligible. I was a player coach, but I was made ineligible for the rugby team to play a couple of months in because there was a rule that when they recruited me, they hadn't looked at. And it said that if you'd done your undergraduate degree abroad, you weren't eligible to play. I was pretty annoyed, but... I was still coaching the team and I still had that fire. Like I was an athlete and 
I was like, right, well, if I can't play rugby, I'm going to do something else. And I saw on the notice board in, in the school that there was walk-on tryouts for the football team, American football. Now, I'd never, barely ever held an American football, but I watched NFL growing up and I like Rob Gronkowski. So I said, right, I'm going to try that. So went and tried out for the football team, got selected and started playing with the football team. And it was in preseason, so it was really intense. But one day then we were in training and I fell on my shoulder and it seemed like nothing. I broke my nose and got surgery for that, but I'd never, never done anything too major. And I just kept playing and kind of the pain didn't go away. And the pain was getting kind of duller and, and worse and lingering in my shoulder. And then I started taking some painkillers to try and get through the trainings to the end of the year. And then the, the pain was just getting worse and worse and worse. So anyway, I went, got an MRI and had to get surgery on my shoulder and got the surgery four or five months later at home when I went home for Christmas and then was rehabbing my shoulder and another four or five months after rehabbing the physio or athletic trainer told me that I could go back catching, passing a ball. Then I passed the ball once and just felt a jolt in my shoulder and was just like, oh, this isn't good. And around that time I was graduating and I had been signed to play with a team in Chicago and they were giving me a deal like they were putting me up and they were looking after me they were going to have a professional rugby team there with major league rugby this is 2017 they were due to have a team and I just signed to play with them and then this happened and then my mobility started to go and so I was I was due to go up like a week later to Chicago. So I went up and then my shoulder was just getting worse and worse to a point when I was up there, I couldn't move my arm. They knew I had surgery, but I should have been good six months, seven months out to start training again. And anyway, it was just getting worse and worse. And I was trying to like play it off and I couldn't move my arm. So I was like catching a ball with one hand. And it was at that point that I started to think, oh no, this is, this is bad because they're looking after me I'm meant to be this player this is my life now so I knew how bad this was my shoulder it it was fucked I couldn't move my arm I could barely sleep I couldn't sleep on one side and I started drinking again then started taking drugs as well because I thought well I've nothing now like I was Mm. a rugby player and I had these dreams I was always working hard and I was going to make it work and and now this is just taken away I'm like an invalid I'm kind of a fraud like they're they're looking after me but I can't even play and so I just went into a spiral and yeah I was drinking heavily taking drugs and then I went and told them and I told the coach I was like look I'm I'm no good here I got to a point where the way I was living I knew it wasn't me I knew there was something wrong I was like this is not me like my injury is there but the way I'm living like I don't want to be doing this Like, I don't want to be drinking and doing all this stuff. And so I just told the coach in Chicago, I got onto my parents back home and moved back to Ireland because I knew that would get me away from the environment where I could Mm -hmm. be drinking all the time and doing drugs and stuff. And so somewhat it was good in that sense, but like I was still in a very dark place, a very, very dark place. And But what I knew back then was that the reason I was in the dark place was because I wasn't able to play rugby. Like I wasn't even able to exercise. Like I couldn't go on a stationary bike or go for a walk because my shoulder was that sore. So I knew that that was an issue. And so I went about getting that fixed, went to see a specialist. They gave me cortisol injections, a couple of rounds of them and physio and starting over the rehabilitation process again. So this is nine months after surgery and I was waiting four months for the surgery. So I'd been a year out of the game really. And a year I'd been able to exercise and stuff. So I realized then how important exercise is for your mental health because even exercise had been taken away from me and all this stuff started to add up. And anyway, I started getting back towards myself and I knew that I needed to get back on my path or get back to having a goal. Like I was waking up with no goal, no purpose in life. And once I started the rehabilitation for my shoulder, it started to give me purpose. Like I I got exercises and even though I could barely lift a two pound weight, I was on a path and that's all I needed. So I was on a path and I knew that I was just making progress slowly, but surely. And then I got back onto the field for my local club and played a game or two, but 
I decided I needed to get out of there. I needed to get going again, we'll say. So I went back to the States coaching, playing, and then go to Vancouver. And I remember I went to the airport to go on that plane to get back to the States to coach and to play. And I remember as I was walking through the airport, going to the US customs, I remember thinking this thought came into my mind and it was, I would prefer to get through customs and the plane go down than I would to have to turn around and go back to doing nothing at home with my parents. And don't get me wrong, it's not my parents. They're the best people in the world, but I was just going nowhere. And that thought came through my mind and instantly I was like, Jesus Christ, like Brian, stop, like what? And it was at that point, that moment that I realized how depressed I was. I literally had a suicidal thought and I caught it straight away. I was like, Jesus. And it scared me. It really scared me. But it was at that moment that I, as I needed to look into this a bit more and I needed to find ways to get back to being myself. The purpose thing about having a purpose and exercise and all that, and that was there. But I, I then started reading about philosophy, psychology, and that started my journey into mental health like more than just performance in sport like when I was younger it was about how can I be a better athlete mm. on the field whereas now it was like I had just been knocked to my knees and my mental health was in the gutter and I, I remember just thinking like I need to find a way to be happy again that was about five years ago and that's when I really started looking into this bigger world a bit more yeah. And when you had that moment there, did you think to go see a doctor? Did you talk to anyone about what was going through your mind? How did you work through that next period? No. So I remember just thinking, I need to get back to my purpose. I had the awareness to know that I had problems at home, but it was just normal. I was never depressed. I was never anxious. I was never anything. It was just sad. And that's normal. So I had tough times in the past, but I was always able to cope with them, deal with them quite okay, even though they were very sad times. I knew I'd get through it and I kept going and going and going. And I always had my sport that I could get away from it all. And at this time that was taken away from me and I'm just feeling so bad and I can't see any brightness. And it's like, I see no future even. So I knew that I needed to get that back. Unfortunately, I didn't think to go and see a doctor. I would encourage everyone to go and seek help. And to be honest, people talk about talk to a friend and find help. But from my experience, that was five years ago. And when I was in that situation, I saw it as a weakness because I had been a rugby player and this, that, the other, and even achieved it, got good grades in school or like got degrees. And I just finished an MBA and I'd always achieved. And so I certainly thought that I just got to work through this. Yeah. which is not the right way to go about it. But I'm just saying it. it is not easy to talk to somebody when you're in that place. And it's so easy to say, just talk to someone. But I didn't do it. And I didn't even think about it, to be honest. Yeah, it is a hard thing to do. It took me 20 years to open up about my mental health journey. And mine started at eight years old. And it was 28 when I finally walked into a doctor's office and said, I think enough's enough. I'm not showing up the way that I want to. And out of those words, I think I've got a mental health issue. It's hugely challenging. And for a lot of people and guys particularly, because we grow up being told that boys don't cry, boys are tough. To be a man is to be tough. And particularly when you play something like rugby or physical sport, it's reinforced on the field as well, because you dare not get hit and then be on the ground crying because You'd be the next target of the next big hit or you might not even get back on the field again. The coach might cut you from the team. So it's kind of one of those environments where you're conditioned socially to be tough and to suck it up and to keep going as well. I remember growing up watching footy on the TV and this is before the blood rules and concussion rules came into play. And basically you'd see older players with blood pouring out of their heads all sorts and just soldiering on through the game and the commentators would be even saying oh look at this guy he's so strong and so courageous to be able to do that and now I guess we've come a long way in that kind of mentality but yeah growing up in that environment I can see why it might have been hard for you to open up as a guy particularly when we're conditioned to not talk about things you've got your podcast as well and I know that you've shared some of your story on your podcast and 
What's it like now sharing this mental health story with your rugby mates and your family and all that? What's kind of some of the responses that you've been receiving for sharing your mental health journey? Yeah, the responses have been incredible. And to be honest, I've only recently started to. So I set up the off-field rugby pod to speak with other players, coaches about their journeys and to help young players learn from them. So like I've had some of the best players in the world on. I've been lucky to play with guys who've gone on to become top players in the world and I've had them on. And to be honest, I think maybe it was even, we'll say insecurity or uh, imposter syndrome maybe even to share my own story like I was very much like I'll just be the host I'll just facilitate this and let these superstars talk about things because who am I I only played this level whatever and I put an episode out about talking about my journey and just sharing bits and pieces from it but I remembered how a massive help for me was hearing other men talk about their struggles on podcasts so it was five years ago I remember it and hearing a guy who is an artist talk about it his challenges with anxiety different things and then I heard a guy who actually played in the Leinster Academy Irish underage like similar levels to me and then went on to be a musician like really really successful but he talked about his challenges as well and those two people I remember hearing those and they helped me more than anything, really. Mm. And if I didn't hear them, I don't know where I'd be. But so, yeah, it gave me the courage to start to talk about it more. And I feel now, I feel great in talking about it because I know how much it helps. And I suppose I'm in a place where I can talk about it. Like, I'm good. I'm loving life. Like, and everything's all good. And thankfully, and it has been for the last couple of years, to be honest, it really has been. And... Now I nearly enjoy it because I know how much it'll help someone. But just from my own experience of hearing those two people talk on maybe two or three podcasts each, not even that much, not even, it wasn't as if I was listening to them every week for two years and they were only talking about mental health. These are people who are doing other things who just talk a little bit about their stories as well. And so, yeah, just so, so, so helpful. And I know the more I hear other people just share it in the media or whatever even now it just helps a little bit more it's just nice to hear it and see it and it just all these little things help so yeah I enjoy it now to be honest and people reach out and they go oh that's so brave of you or that was so great you saying that and well done and this that the other I got these kind of messages and it's like they're lovely like thank you the sentiment lovely but I'm at a point now where where I don't know, I don't even see as brave. It just is what it is. Like I think in society realizes now that it's just it's just better if people do be honest and talk about mm. it. and it's not a weakness. What I mean, whereas before it was very much seen as a weakness and I saw it as a weakness when I was in my early twenties or whatever. So when everyone views it as a weakness, then yeah, probably is brave to say, Hey, I got this weakness. Whereas now I don't come across anyone who sees it as a weakness, to be honest. So no one sees it as a weakness. Everyone sees it as a strength. So actually, to be honest, for me, it's not as challenging with where I'm at now, thankfully. Yeah, and it goes to mindset as well. Like for years, you weren't in the mindset to be able to openly talk about it. You've had that shift. You've had that, I guess, insight and that reflective moment going, okay, now's the time to talk about it. And you mentioned how you listen to the podcast. And that's why I love being a podcaster myself and having my own podcast and listening to podcasts is that you can hear stories from people across the world that are very similar to your story or or a story maybe a few steps ahead of you in terms of coming out and talking about things like mental health. But it also helps us, I guess, feel less alone in the world as well. So for example, I've lived with OCD since I was eight years old and through podcasting and social media, I was able to find other people that live with OCD and hear their stories and all of a sudden realize, yeah, the stuff that I went through from eight years old to 38 years old is I'm not so different. And there's other people that have struggled that have got help. So I really value this kind of medium and also value you know, your, your story as well, because it might be someone listening. It could be an eight-year-old boy listening here who he wants to play rugby for his national team, going through something like mental illness or maybe a family member passing away or something like that and hear your story and then go, 
what, if Brian can do it, then maybe I can do it as well. And that's really heartwarming to know that that might happen as well. And what I love about sharing your lived experience is that you can then use your lived experience to fuel your passion. And we talk about mindset and performance coaching. So I'd love to kind of dive into this now, if you don't mind. And based on your experience, why is mindset so important for athletes? How can they overcome or how do you help them overcome some mindset blocks that are holding them back? Yeah, so mindset is so, so, so important for athletes. Like you'll hear a lot of people say it's all about the top two inches and physical preparation is also obviously as important. I don't know, whatever the the split is or the ratio, but you can see it on TV. Sometimes when you see an athlete, be it a tennis player, footy player, whatever, and you go, their head's gone and they just capitulate and you can see it as clear as day. And I know they're going to miss And so the flip side of that is you can see when someone is supremely confident in their abilities and just they're going to win just by looking at them. I used to watch a lot of tennis growing up and I love that because it's a one-on-one sport, whereas in a 15-a-side sport, it's one or two players can be going through stuff, but it's hard to notice that. But I remember in tennis, you can see it as clear as day and when heads drop. So yeah, it's just so, so important. And the reason that I started everything, as I said, was when I was younger, my sister dying and my parents having their challenges. I thought I was the only person in the world that had those challenges. Genuinely thought I was the only person in the world. And I thought I will not make it or I will not achieve my dreams because of this stuff that's going on as well. Even though I was working hard and I did my very best at working and I did to an extent, I did make the Irish under 19s, but then other things happened. But it's just so, so important. Like, Every player knows it when you're in the zone. It feels like the game is slowed down. Mm. If you're not thinking about the score, you're not worrying about what the coach might think. You're not thinking about making a mistake. You are just thinking like, get me the ball. Like I can't be stopped. Like I just am like Superman here or Superwoman. And that feeling is just incredible. And you can get there very, very regularly. You can get there all the time. And there are tools by which when you work on it, that you can get into that mindset during a game. And everyone also knows when you knock on a ball or you make a mistake or you miss a shot or whatever, and your head drops and you think, oh, I'm going to get dropped now. Oh, the lads are going to think I'm shit. Oh, no. And you're thinking, don't give me the ball. You're in your head. And so those two different people, it's like, One can be a 10 out of 10, one can be a 1 out of 10 performance, but they can be the same person physically. They can be the same person. So that difference between 10 out of 10 and 1 out of 10 is just mindset. So it's it's so, so important. And that's why I wrote the book on how you become a pro rugby player. Because when I was a kid, as I said, I got gym programs. I got told to work hard, but I used to just think, oh, fingers crossed today will go well. And that then builds up a worry. Because you think, well, it might go well. Oh, hopefully it does go well. Oh, I'll just try not to think about it. Oh, I'm thinking about it again. Oh, geez, I'm nervous. Oh, these nerves are these nerves are don't feel good. These nerves are feeling worse than they did last week. I don't think I'll be able to play today. Oh, I don't know if it'll go well. And everything is just up to chance. If you don't have help and you don't have frameworks and tools by which to deal with all this stuff, then it's just always up to chance. Some days it'll go well, some days it won't go well. And you can have the one out of ten or the ten out of ten, but when you prepare mentally the way you would prepare physically like the way a lot of players do then you you absolutely avoid all those ones twos fives out of tens you might have a bad game and get us have a six out of ten of course but you don't capitulate so what kind of framework do you use with the athletes do you have anything that you're willing to share in terms of maybe a a tip or tool that you use with an athlete to try and maybe improve their mindset or even not necessarily improve it but just tune into their mindset Yeah, for sure. So a big one that I find when I work with players one-on-one is nerves and dealing with nerves and they get overwhelmed with nerves and it becomes anxiety and really affects their performance. So the feeling you get in your stomach of nervousness is a release of adrenaline. That feeling in your stomach, sometimes you feel it in your legs, is just a release of adrenaline. And what adrenaline does is it allows you to not feel pain essentially it gives you more energy it gives you more focus 
So that's why when you're competing and you're playing in a rugby match or even Aussie rules or whatever it is, and you get a, a jostle, you don't feel it. You're just mm-hmm. like, let's go. Cause you're pumped with adrenaline and it also gives you energy to, be able to play for 80 minutes. And so the first thing is, is understanding in your mind that you want that, you want that feeling. So it's to not fight it. So when that feeling comes, what a lot of players do is they go, oh, no, no. Oh, my God, Mm. no. I feel so nervous. Oh, no. And they try and fight it. And they tell themselves this is not good. They allow themselves, they make themselves feel uncomfortable with it. It stresses them. And so the first thing is, is understanding that it's a good thing. You need it. You want it. So then the next thing is to be able to connect with your breath. And be able to breathe and become present. And that's a practice in meditation or or breath work. It's a practice that you do throughout the week. Conscious, mindful breathing and connecting to your breath and maybe looking at the trees, going for a walk, putting your phone away and just being present. So then when it comes to match day and you feel those nerves, you have practiced being present. And it's always an ongoing practice for all of us. But you have an ability to be present and to witness the feelings they're not going to go away the nerves but just witness it and breathe and smile and think about how much you love playing rugby think about how much you love being out on the field because you do so yeah you're feeling this now but you're breathing you're smiling like physically smiling releases endorphins in our brain and is really good and and so you're relaxing and you're allowing that feeling to just be you're not judging it And you're thinking about how much you love playing rugby and how much you you want to be here versus trying to get away from that and being stressed and just seeing it as a bad thing. So that's something that's really important. Another one, when I work with teams, players, what a big thing is, is worry. So worrying about what will happen in the game, worrying about if I make a mistake, will I get dropped? Worrying about what will the coach think if I don't know my plays? Just worrying. And so a lot of players, their whole sport is they worry. And when you started playing as a kid, you weren't just worrying all the time. You're playing because you loved it. Like you love just playing. And so being in the zone or the flow state is a state of no mind. You're essentially not thinking. And so you're definitely not worrying. You're not thinking if this happens, then what will happen after? If I knock this ball on, then what will that coach think? Or if I don't score two tries today, will I get selected in the rep team Mm. in three months time? These are all thoughts that go on in players' heads. And so once again, another practice, and it's not like I say something and it's like flicking a switch and it's changed forever. It's you have to practice these like mental skills are like physical skills. So I show you how to do press-ups. You don't do 10 press-ups or 100 press-ups for one day and then become Jack. You got to do it every day. And so, (laughs) and then you get, you get more physically competent. So the same way you do your mental skills every day or Mm. practice them regularly and you become more mentally competent, we'll say. And so uh, the worrying is a big one. So just being aware that worrying does not help you. So I used to think that I needed to be pent up Mm. and be kind of on edge and be like, pacing around the dressing room and being essentially a ball of nerves or worry and then I'd get out of the field and I'd be able to get into it I used to think that that was necessary but it's absolutely not and it's actually a negative so what you need to do is let go let go of all that worrying let go of the expectations that you put upon yourself that's another big one players will say I need to score two tries say Mm. I need to kick all my kicks I need to be the man or the woman today for my team and you're just piling pressure on yourself so let going of all the expectation on yourself let go essentially you can say fuck it what'll be will be Mm. i'm just going playing a bit of ball here of course give it your all but everyone always gives it their all so give it your all and just have a crack have a go don't worry about what the coach will think don't worry about what anyone will think don't worry about anything and just have a crack and when you approach it from that mindset the funny thing is things work out you play well and so it's it's a practice the awareness the breathing and that's where mindfulness is very very important for sport to be skilled or to be able to be present and with that presence comes awareness and everything else so 
that's something that's important to practice throughout the week. So then during games, you can once again be present and not get in your head and, and worry about all these different things. And I often say it's like when you're playing rugby or football in the schoolyard as a kid, when you're eight, you're not thinking about anything. You're just what's next job. You're just in the moment. So that's like peak performance. And so it's like <laughs> when I work with players or teams, it's like helping them get back to that, what they were as a kid, because now yeah. you've just spent years conditioning yourself to worry. We talked a bit about your injury earlier on. So for, for athletes who have got injured and that can often feel like the world is coming and down around them because injury does stop people's professional careers going further. Like how do you incorporate some of this into someone who's injured and wanting to get back on the track? Yeah. So the first thing, and I talk about this in the chapter, get help in so far as get expert help and lean on as much help as you can. Don't try and do it all on your own. I know when I was younger, I tried to do it all on my own. I think it might be a bit of a man thing, but it was like, I'll do it all on my own. So get physio help, lean on your coaches. Not many teams have mental skills coaches, but if you can talk to a mental skills coach, a mindset and performance coach do. If you have a mentor, a mentor can be brilliant because once again, with my injury, it was it was dark. But if I was talking to someone once a week who had been through what I'd been through, then that person I know would have been able to help. So the first thing is, is to lean on all the help or get as much help as you can. And once again, I remember thinking it was weakness that like, I'll do it on my own. I'll power through, I'll push on, but no. And I read a thing a couple of years ago now that LeBron James spends a million dollars a year on himself. So you think about LeBron James will have a mindset and performance coach. He will have a personal masseuse. He will have a personal trainer. He will have a personal assistant to do his admin. He will probably have a chef. He will have skills coaches, shooting coaches. He'll have an agent. He'll have a manager. He'll have everyone helping him with every little minor part of his life. Now, of course, you can't spend a million dollars, but you can get the help of people around you. And so it's so important to to just do that, to be of that mindset. That really helps. Another thing besides that, when I do work with players who are injured, is setting little goals. So this week, what can we do? And and really attack those and get help from a physio that you trust. That's another big one. And they say to you, you hit these markers in three weeks, you'll be here. In two months, you'll be here. In three months, you'll be back on the field. So getting that reassurance from the medical side really helps. And then from the mindset side, some people will want to be around the team and will want to help in whatever way they can. Others will want to get away from the team because they're not playing. So it's different for everyone. Maybe you want to be around the team and be the the water boy or be the person putting on the music in the gym or help in some way that you can. And if you want to do that, do that. But if you want to step away from the team, do. And mm. that depends on who you are. And then, yeah, just bringing it back to the week and executing on that on a Sunday everyone I work with I talk to them on a Sunday to plan your week and I talk about that in the book on how you become a pro rugby player as well is to plan your week if you've got to get three gym sessions done put them down Monday morning Tuesday morning Wednesday afternoon if you've got to go meet your friends put it down plan it out and so just having that focus of those things you got to execute really really help and yeah. then of course you can do other things as well outside of rugby and outside of rehab which also help, which can take your mind away from it and give you a bit of purpose away from that as well. So from a sport point of view, maybe it's coaching a, an underage team or if you're studying, doing a project or I don't know, if you're interested in knitting or whatever it is, doing, taking on another project, whatever it is, just finding something else as well can really help with that. And yeah. so yeah, there's lots of different stuff you can do. I think the highlight for me of our chat is it's a holistic approach to life. It's not just the physical aspect of being a sportsman is bringing the mental stuff. It's bringing mindfulness. I love mindfulness and I love how you've described mindfulness and sport as well. But as you touched on at the end there, it's, there's things outside of sport that make you who you are as well. It's your interests, it's your hobbies, it's your study, it's your work, whatever it is. And you can really bring in that holistic version of yourself and live that authentic life in many ways. So Brian, I could talk to you all day. I really am fascinated by your journey and your story, but I'd love for you to plug your book and your podcast as well. Yeah. So the book is the book on how you become a pro rugby player. It's available on Amazon. You can get it there and what to expect. So the 
Section one is develop your mental strength, talks about uh, setting a goal, overcoming limiting beliefs. So an interesting one, I kind of touched on this earlier, but when I work with players one-on-one, I'll say, what's your dream? What do you want to achieve? And they'll say, I want to achieve this. And then I'll say, if you couldn't fail, if failure wasn't going to happen, what would your dream be? Oh, well, if that's the case, then I'd go for this. So straight away, their limiting beliefs are what are holding them back from achieving what they really want to achieve. So section one is about that, knowing your why. Section two is about playing in the zone. So like a lot of what we talked about there with dealing with nerves, not having worries going on to the field, talk about preparation, talk about game day, beginner's mindset, lots of different things, lifestyle. And then the third section of the book is how you get paid to play. So how you actually go about getting into pathway systems, getting paid by clubs to play rugby, because once again, that's that's what a lot of kids' dreams are. And it's so, so achievable. It's crazy. When I was younger, I thought it was only the internationals on the TV that got paid. But the way rugby is nowadays, you can travel all over the world and get paid to do it. And so in the yeah. section three of the book, I talk about that and how you do that. And yeah, available on Amazon, the off-field rugby pod, you can listen to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I talk with players from all over the world. I had Scott Fardy on recently in Aussie and I've had a couple others. Yeah, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Then if you want to chat to me, get in touch. My Instagram is off-field rugby and my website is offfieldrugby.com and yeah if you have any questions thoughts about anything we chatted about if you're a player or you're a coach of a team and yeah for sure get in touch would love to help wonderful and i'll put the links on show notes so people can access those wherever they're hearing this or watching this we've got the youtube channel as well but last question i'll ask you before i let you go is I like to to finish off each episode with my guests plugging something that makes them feel good. It doesn't have to be anything about rugby or mindset or mindfulness or mental health. It's just something that's making you feel good and maybe something that our listeners can go and check out for themselves as well. Yeah, something that just straight away comes to mind as you're talking about it is not opening my phone for the first hour of the day and Mm -hmm. putting it away at least an hour before bed. And having that time, because that first hour of the day, and that feeds into morning routine, that feeds into when you're not on your phone, and then building a little morning routine. So I suppose morning routine would be huge. So for me, I don't know, when you say plug it, like I'm plugging morning routines, I'm plugging, get up half an hour, an hour earlier, leave your phone outside of the bedroom, have a an old alarm clock that just goes off and <laughs> stretch, so. go for a walk, yeah. drink some water. And have your morning to yourself. That for me is like, is incredible. And then one other quick one. I love the sauna and uh, Mm. that kind of stuff as well. So anyway, morning routine, put the phone away at night, go to the sauna when you can. Wonderful. Brian, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your story. It is an inspiring story and it's one full of hurt, but also recovery and growth and progress as well. So thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Cheers, Simon. Thanks, Emil. And well done with everything you're doing. It's incredible. And I love your mission and the message that you help facilitate. Well, that's a wrap for today's episode, and I hope you got some value from it. If anything triggered your mental health today, please reach out to your support networks. Also, if you love what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your mates. For more from Mindful Men, you can check us out on Instagram and YouTube and I'll throw the links to these pages in the show notes below. But until next time, stay mindful.